Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are interviewing Jack Tater and Chris Berniski, who are the authors of Crypto Assets, the Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. We'll walk through the universe of crypto assets, classify them, talk about how to value them and how they should be part of any smart investor's portfolio. Jack and Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us, you guys. Cool. So let's let's begin with yourself, Jack. You've had a sort of a long um, professional career in the investment management field. Tell us your story about how you got involved in the blockchain space. Yes, appreciate it. So uh, I've spent nearly three decades in financial services from being a financial advisor sitting with clients and taking a look at investment portfolios. Uh, and I guess back in 2013, after writing about retirement, uh, I discovered the thing called Bitcoin. And uh, we took a look at it. I run a research firm. We took a look at it from the research perspective. And at the time, uh, we produced a research report that soon turned into a small book called What's the Deal with Bitcoin? Uh, but then I started to take a look at it as an investment vehicle, writing on retirement, my view was, well, can Bitcoin be considered an asset and an investment? So that led to a series of uh, uh, articles on MarketWatch about investing in Bitcoin for retirement, following the ups and downs uh, of that investment, and ultimately it doing pretty well for me as an investment. That led me down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and crypto assets and soon led me uh, to fortunately connect with Chris Berniski, and that led to the book. So, uh, and since that time, I've been involved in some startups. I've been an angel investor to a number of startups. I've also been uh, an advisor to a number of startups in the crypto space. Uh, so I'm, I'm down the rabbit hole right now. And uh, like you said, I've had a long experience and I think I can bring some of the financial uh, analysis side of it into this as well. So, so Jack, I, met, I mean, retirement, Portfolios, retirement planning <laughs> sounds like a very kind of old fashioned thing. I imagine leather couch and glass of scotch <laughs> and that kind of thing. So uh, how is that perceived? I mean, you must have been like among the first people in that area to think about or write about Bitcoin. What, what did your colleagues say? Well, it did take a lot of scotch to obviously, you know, uh, convince these uh, <laughs> colleagues that I was uh, going down the right, uh, the right path there. But, uh, uh, so, you know, soon you young guys will have to deal with retirement as well. But I think what um, what was interesting is when I did write the articles and I wrote them on Market Watch, which really was a financial investment platform. And, you know, you're talking back in 2014, 2015. And I remember specifically one article and I invested my own money into this. And I did it in such a manner, I'm sure we'll be discussing uh, the financial planning aspects of it. But uh, I remember writing one article where I essentially lost half of my investment. Uh, and at the time, I couldn't get out of it. And a traditional investor might get out if they've lost 50%. I couldn't get out of it because of the structure of the investment. And I remember writing the article, and I think it was one of the most commented articles in MarketWatch. And, and I contend that no one has been called an idiot or a moron more than I have been in this one article. And so it was great. And I, now I wear it as a badge of honor because about six months later, I wrote an article about how it was the best investment in uh, my uh, retirement account. But I think at the time, people, and this is back in 2014, where, you know, this was well before even Jamie Dimon was stepping up and calling it a fraud and then realizing, oh, yeah, he made a mistake. Uh, so, so, yeah, there was a lot of criticism around it. But once again, I did it in the concept of not taking a moonshot, but putting it in as a, what I felt was a suitable investment and crafting it into my asset allocation models. Uh, but it, believe me, there was a lot of justice when, when I did write some follow-up articles where I had made a lot of money and secured my retirement and all those other people who now call me a moron. I don't know where they are, but it's very easy to do that from the internet. But, uh, uh, but I do have to get the leather couch. I like that idea. I'll go with the leather couch. The scotch, you know, everything else, we, we, you know, that's good as well. So I do, I do want to 
toot Jack's horn for a second because that book, What's the Deal with Bitcoins, he put out May 2013. So that was before, you know, the late 2013 run, the first time Bitcoin crossed $1,000, the you know, far before it had really crossed mainstream consciousness. I think we had an, an early run early on in 2013, right? We went from something like um, $3 to 30 or was it 30 to 300 But we had that uh, run in spring of 2013, but it was really November of 2013 that put Bitcoin on the mainstream radar for the first time. And Jack was in there before that. Um, and he was in there when we were all calling it Bitcoins. And so um, when I did my due diligence on Jack, he definitely earned a lot of street cred for me when I saw he'd, he had published uh, in May 2013 an actual book. I, I think the, the, and I appreciate that, Chris, thanks. What's interesting is many people say to me, well, I guess you were buying Bitcoin back in 2013. And uh, sad to say, uh, I, I wish I had, but at the time, the only place that you could really buy it was with Mt. Gox. So I could have potentially have bought it and who knows where it would have would have ended up? Maybe with uh, Carpellis and his cats, or whatever, uh, whatever ended up with uh, with, the, with the funds there. Uh, but it's been interesting to follow since that time. So uh, uh, yeah, I've been involved. I've seen a lot of uh, seen a lot of things. I know where the bodies are buried. So thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Yeah, and and of course, Chris. Actually, I remember you sent because uh, because you were at this company, Arc Investments, and. I remember that you you guys wrote a paper there about Bitcoin being this new asset class, and 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 you sent it to us because you were a podcast listener. This was like a long time ago, and I remember seeing it. It was like, oh, this, this could make an interesting episode, and like it was always sort of in the back of my mind. So it's it's been a long time that I've kind of wanted to have you on and and, and talk with you. So I'm glad it finally happens. Well, thank you. So. What was ARK Investment and how was that through that job that you first became interested in Bitcoin or how did that happen? Well, personally, I had a friend drag me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole uh, in my last year of college. So early in 2012, I think it was, um, dragged me down um, and was, you know, really excited about a number of concepts. But at the time, the main application um, that Bitcoin supported was the Silk Road. Um, I don't even think Coinbase was around at that point. It was very limited in terms of what you could do in the ecosystem if you weren't a developer. Um, and so while it was an interesting thought experiment for me, and I've gone back and I've looked, I have like a, a Facebook post on a company page that I was working on uh, like about Bitcoin and I've had friends come back to me with conversations that, to be honest, I don't remember um, about Bitcoin um, in that period. There was then about a two-year gap um, where I remained tangentially interested, but again, didn't think of Bitcoin as an employment opportunity until I joined this firm, ARK Investment Management, in the summer of 2014. Um, ARK was a startup at the time, uh, didn't have any funds, um, so was just getting off the ground, just crafting um, its portfolios, and as a thematic technology investor, um, I was put on the next generation internet theme, and that involved putting in the elements to that theme, um, which included things like cloud computing, internet of things, machine learning, social media, and we ended up putting cryptocurrency in there as an element. Um, and our director of research was, was a big proponent of Bitcoin, as was um, Kathy Wood, our CEO, CIO, and so everyone was on board, but this was, I mean, the, the ETF that I worked for originally, ARKW, um, when we launched that in October of 2014, there was pretty much no way to get Bitcoin exposure into an ETF. And so we held like uh, token plays, not in the 2017 sense of the term, but um, more these small, cute plays like NVIDIA, right, for the GPUs or Taiwan Semiconductor, who has the fabrication plants that produce the ASICs that go into a lot of Bitcoin rigs, but nothing substantial. And we were actually approached by Grayscale, who had um, the Bitcoin Investment Trust that would be coming online, um, exiting from the pri private placement into GBTC. So they approached us in late 2014 because they said, hey, here's this public fund manager that has ETFs that has cryptocurrency on their website. Um, and so that kicked off... Um, 
a about uh, three quarters of a year to a year of due diligence on Bitcoin. The paper, um, well, I, I published a couple of papers summer of 2015. I had to look deeply into the long-term security of Bitcoin's network, so the long-term incentive model, and trying to figure out what an equilibrium transaction fee would need to be to sufficiently secure the network from a 51% attack. All kind of uh, sort of nerdy stuff that I would have had to do if I were due diligencing, um, you know, an equity like Red Hat or Facebook. Different, but um, different uh, things I had to investigate, but same amount of rigor. And then ARK became the first public fund manager to invest in Bitcoin in September of 2015, with the first purchases of GBTC happening in the mid-20 range, when Bitcoin was in the mid-200s. And I think GBTC got all the way to $3,000. Um, at its peak. And so it's been a phenomenal investment. Um, and that gave me leverage to just increasingly focus on crypto, um, really lost all interest in, in equities um, uh, by late 2015, early 2016. And so I ran with ARK's crypto effort for about two years and then very amicably have transitioned on. I remain involved with ARK and as a board uh, on the board of ARK, but then um, now I'm running my own firm called Placeholder, which is a venture capital firm that invests in decentralized information networks incentivized by a token. And I'm doing that with Joel Monegro. Fantastic. Well, so let's get into the, the first thing that seems to be something dear uh, to your hearts, which is this question of uh, how do we call these things? Uh, cryptocurrency, of course, is the term that's most often used, but doesn't necessarily make so much sense uh, for, for many of these things. Why do you guys think this is so important, what we call them, and what are your proposals in that regard? Well, we named the book Crypto Assets um, to, to be very clear that we think this asset class goes beyond currencies. And you referenced, Brian, a little bit ago, the new asset class white paper I put out with Coinbase that we sent to you in, in 2016. And it really draws from the seeds of what we, we, la we, we lay down in that paper in that this asset class as a whole, I think of more as an asset class native to information networks. And the novel ways in which it um, organizes and incentivizes human activity, I find to be an innovation much more akin to uh, when the, the joint stock companies in the early 1600s were created to fund uh, merchant ventures, right? Long-term um, capital projects for return on that capital. And so really pulling this asset class and this movement out of the currency conversation, because that gets us into all kinds of dead-end arguments and conversations around, you can't have so many currencies and they're too volatile and yada, 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 and more pulling back and saying, okay, this asset class as a whole, we call crypto assets. Within that asset class, there are verticals, just as within the equity asset class, there are verticals by sector or market cap or growth or value or whatever it may be. And so within crypto assets, we think of right now three verticals. There will likely be more in the future. Um, we might actually have a fourth. Um, but uh, cryptocurrencies, crypto commodities, crypto tokens, and the fourth that you could maybe add with crypto kitties is crypto collectibles. But um, if we just start with cryptocurrencies, um, you know, per economics, the definition of a currency is something that serves as a means of exchange, store of value, and unit of account. So means of exchange is exchanging this unit um, for goods and services, store of value is self-explanatory, and unit of account is really the measuring stick of value. And those are things like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Zcash, Monero, Ripple, those guys target being a currency in a more universal sense. But most of the assets out there, I would argue, right now are crypto commodities, which Ethereum kicked off. And so just as in the physical world, we have physical commodities like oil, wheat, natural gas, bananas, um, copper, gold, so on and so forth. Um, and those commodities um, lay the, the foundation um, to building finished goods and services. I would say in the crypto space, we are seeing the birth of, digital, of markets to price digital commodities. So why can't I trade you know, on CME cloud storage futures or bandwidth futures or GPU flop futures or all kinds of derivatives off of those digital commodities? 
And I think that what the crypto markets are creating are these global 24-7 markets to price these digital commodities and provision these digital commodities, which is extremely important when we think about this transition from physical to digital that pretty much our entire society is going through. The last one, and I'll keep it brief, of crypto tokens is really when we just think of, again, using the physical analogs of currencies and commodities come together, form an economy to produce finished goods and services, I think of cryptocurrencies and crypto commodities as laying these foundational layers, um, blockchain layers and application service layers, so that finished digital goods and services can be provisioned to consumers. Um, and a lot of those finished digital goods and services will have their own tokens. So this is things like you know, Augur or Steam or Aragon I may even put in there. Um, and so that is, that, that is the stack that I, that I think of, that we think of for this space right now. This, is, uh, this whole point about crypto assets I think is very important because I've grown very frustrated with seeing the press and seeing the media constantly refer to this whole space as cryptocurrencies. And they equate everything back to Bitcoin. And, and we really need to recognize that there are these differences that Chris has laid out within the whole category uh, of what we're discussing here. Ether cannot be compared to Bitcoin. And, and we keep hearing the press say, oh, well, you know, which cryptocurrency is going to survive, Ether and Bitcoin? They are different. And it's very, very important. And it's a major part of what we wanted to accomplish in the book was to divide this space up as Chris has mentioned. Additionally, it's also important when you start to take a look at investments and evaluating these businesses and these coins because they do have different uses. And at, potentially at some point in the future, you're going to see this classification come into play when we have investment vehicles, like Chris is saying, cloud futures and things along those lines that are going to provide diversification within this space for investors. So it's very, very important that people don't put everything under the concept of cryptocurrencies. And, and I honestly believe 2018 will be the year that will pull the curtain aside and show people that there is more to this space than just Bitcoin. And part of that is to get away from solely looking at Bitcoin and solely referring to the space as cryptocurrencies and recognizing that they're crypto assets. And accordingly, as an asset, they're investable uh, vehicles. So let's explore the boundary between some of these uh, categories. So you can start with the category cryptocurrency and crypto commodity. So Bitcoin, according to you, is a cryptocurrency. Ether is a crypto commodity. Uh, what defines the boundary for some asset to be a cryptocurrency and a crypto commodity? The boundary is, is inherently fuzzy. Um, and, and all asset class definitions and differentiations um, are fuzzy is, is, is what I found as I've, I've dove into the academic literature over, over the years. The distinction that I make um, between, say, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency and Ethereum as a crypto commodity is Bitcoin's, Bitcoin was brought into the world to serve uh, on a global basis uh, these three use cases, right? Means of exchange, store of value, unit of account. Whereas Ethereum was really brought into the world to provide this decentralized world computer, which I would think of as a digital commodity. Um, and with units of ether converting into gas to pay for access to that, de that decentralized world computer or that digital commodity. And so for that reason, I think it, it and, and early on, you know, when Vitalik talked about ether, I believe he said, you know, this isn't meant to be an investment um, or this isn't meant to be speculated on. I forget the exact quote. Um, and certainly it has, Ether has become an investment over time and something that people speculate on. But really it's the, the genesis, I think, that differentiates. I do want to add one wrinkle here, which um, frustrates some people. But while I agree and I, and I do believe in this classification and, and hope that we can refine the classification. And there's lots of people with good ideas you know, around app coins and utility tokens and different ways of slicing this pie. And I think it's all healthy and it's all additive. One other way to think of these assets, um, if you think of each crypto network 
as a economy that provisions a single good or service or a couple goods or services, then each native unit within that crypto network does technically serve as a currency. And so within that network, it should be source, uh, serving means of exchange, store of value, and unit of account use cases intra-network. Now, what I would argue differentiates between um, something that is serving as a currency intra-network versus a cryptocurrency more broadly is how many networks is it used within, right? And so Bitcoin is this interchange, this, this mother change uh, or mother chain that is used to swap in out and out of all these other assets of all these other crypto networks. And in so doing, it's serving more as a universal currency, which is why I would call it a cryptocurrency, as opposed to a lot of other assets with, which primarily just operate within their own network, their own crypto network. Ether, you know, is, is, is bending these lines because it has gotten so big and used as a means of payment. Um, but uh, those are just some nuances. Yeah, actually, I, I wanted to kind of weigh in on that because I, I think Ether is an interesting example here. On the one hand, of course, you're right, right? It was, it was really like marketed in the beginning in the white paper says, okay, this is like gas, pay for computation on this world computer. But I think if you look at the valuation, it is in my eyes, or, or, or let's put it like this, if it was actually just used for that, I think the valuation should be like much, much lower. And, and you have the problem there too that if the price goes up, the cost of computation goes up, it makes the network less attractive. So people would want to move elsewhere and run the computation elsewhere. Because, you know, to a large extent, I think like running computation on these like blockchain networks is going to be, you know, somewhat uh, somewhat of a commodity, right? You, you'll be able to run it on like one network or the other network, as, you know, as long as they have like somewhat similar uh, security characteristics. So I think if you look at Ether, actually the only way you can justify this valuation is if you assume that it will have this kind of currency function for smart contracts and maybe be used as like collateral or... Uh, and, and so I, I actually think that the if you had like really good stable coins that could move across chains, that could be a huge threat for Ether. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I just I just want to say the fact that we're doing this classification and discussing this classification is a major uh, point about valuing these these assets. Uh, and, and as Chris mentioned before, this is probably going to evolve. But putting the stake in the ground with this taxonomy allows us to better value and evaluate each of these coins and each of these assets. And I think this is going to be very important because there are going to be there are going to be people out there who are smarter than me who are going to analyze this space and bring up a lot of these points and evaluate them within the context of of the of where they stand in terms of this taxonomy and also like you say going across the board. I think it is a very interesting thing Chris mentioned before that maybe there's a fourth crypto uh, uh Collectibles. collectibles right which which is which is interesting but i also think it, in looking back at the book this whole the whole uh, rise of ripple that has that has occurred has also forced me to look back on uh, and chris mentioned it before that that we viewed it as a cryptocurrency and and you almost wonder if some of these some of these assets can potentially change i'm not sure that we can view Ripple as a cryptocurrency anymore. Perhaps it's more of a crypto commodity. But it, what's important is that we set the basis for how to evaluate these coins and, and how to view them. Because what you're going to find in the next year is you're going to find that there will be analysts and there will be tools and resources available to us to now evaluate these assets. We're going to have data, we're going to have smart people looking at this, and what we've tried to do here, and I think what we're going to see more people doing, is laying that foundation for how to evaluate these assets. So when we put together the taxonomy and the division there, it wasn't to be the be-all, end-all. A lot of it was to say, here's a foundation, here's, there's room for growth, and to evaluate it. And, and all of these points that you're bringing up, uh, I think will play well for people to understand how to evaluate these as assets, how to evaluate their network value, and ultimately, can they uh, can they exist and should they be investable uh, in their in their current state? And 
And specifically, I would say uh, you brought up Ripple, Jack, and Brian, you were, you were uh, mentioning Ethereum. I think this is where we go back to while there is this taxonomy of cryptocurrencies, crypto commodities, crypto tokens, and we'll add crypto collectibles, within each asset, each crypto asset within its crypto network acts as the native currency within that crypto network or perhaps a private currency. And so within that network, one of the three use cases is store value. And I think over time, um, we will see battles for different crypto assets to capture more mind share, more store value mind share. Currently, Bitcoin has the most store value mind share. Um, but Ethereum, certainly a lot of Ether holders are using it as a store value um, or, you know, investors that are hoping the future utility value is such that it will lift the price of the asset. But no matter what the asset is, and this is particularly the case for Ripple, um, there needs to be a contingent, I think, of hodlers. If there's not a contingent of hodlers, then you could have, if you have all the entire float of the asset base that is circulating as a means of exchange, you will likely have pretty high velocities. Um, you know, Bitcoin's means of exchange velocity, I estimate at around 15. Most other things are going to be north of that, given the confirmation times. And you could actually have pretty low network values to sustain large, large, large economies or large transaction volumes within these crypto networks. So the store value aspect is key. And we have seen the financialization of so many asset classes. Like if you go back to the early 1970s when we went off the gold standard, that's really when oil and copper and a bunch of physical commodities started more becoming financial or there, there was a whole financialization component added to their utility to the world. And so this is just a continuation of that. And I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. It's just there needs to be a balance, right, between store of value and, and, and the actual utility or means of exchange of a crypto asset. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, I, I guess sort of my impression of the markets today is that almost everything gets treated as if it was kind of the store of value thing and, and valued on that basis. Um, and, and I remember back in 2013 and maybe 14 when people were talking about um, Bitcoin being used for remittances. And it was interesting too, because then I, you know, I did like some kind of math and you look at, okay, the remittance market, right? And let's say now on the one side, I, I like sell euros for Bitcoin and it gets sent over and converted and uh, for a local Nigerian, I don't remember what the currency is called there, but for, yeah. So, and, and if you did the math and if you have to look at the size of the remittance market and you assume that, you know, one of these transactions, maybe they would only hold a Bitcoin for a day uh, and, or it could be less. Uh, and, and then the effect on the price was actually almost negligent. It could, t it could actually be used to, to, to manage a huge amount of the remittance market proportion without really driving up the price. I guess that's kind of your point. This falls into the valuation framework, um, and we could, we could jump to valuation. Um, but this idea that uh, the equation of exchange could become, and I would argue will become, um, the bedrock to crypto asset valuation. So the equation of exchange being M V equals P Q. So M is the monetary base, size of the monetary base. V is the velocity, which you were just kind of implying there, Brian. Um, and then P is the price of the good uh, being offered within that economy or sold. And Q is the quantity. And so within that framework, um, and if we just stick with Bitcoin, right, um, if, if we think of P Q, uh, for the remittance economy as the amount of money transferred using Bitcoin um, to facilitate the, rem the remittance economy, then we, we take something like, okay, there's $500 billion remittance um, economy. Let's say Bitcoin takes 10% of that. That means each year Bitcoin has to move $50 billion um, in order to facilitate that use case. And then, you know, let's, let's assume a velocity of 10 just to, to, to make it easier. We can get into how we quantified velocity later. But a velocity of 10, so I have that, that 50 billion PQ, say, and I'm dividing it by a velocity of V of 10, 
which gets me a necessary monetary base M um, of five billion, uh, which is really not that much in order. Uh, what that would claim is Bitcoin would need to store five billion in value to facilitate 10% of the remittances market at this velocity, right? So there's lots of assumptions baked in there. But then you can start to stack these, right? And the one that everyone uses right, right now is digital gold, right? You have a 2.5 trillion global financial gold market. Um, and I use the global financial gold market, not total ab above ground stock. So 10% of that is 250 billion. And so that currently justifies Bitcoin's network value. And with something like holding, store, uh, holding it as gold or store value, that actually has a velocity of zero. So you pull it out of the float. Um, I've written about this on a lot more detail on Medium, a post called Crypto Asset Valuations, with the whole framework and an, and an uh, open source model on it. But I think there are truly ways we can value these things. Um, but you're absolutely right that uh, right now, the prices of most of these assets are based on expectations of, of future utility and not current utility value. I would just I would just like to draw attention to Chris's post on uh, on Medium around this, uh, and it's it's required reading for anyone who really wants to get a basis for valuation. One of the other posts I like, which uh, which simplifies things for for me, which. Uh, is helpful for me was his post about the the J curve, and this was something I saw during the uh, the dot com era as well. And the crypto J curve that Chris talks about is the fact that assets are made up of uh, utility value and speculative value. And when something comes out, like we saw at the dot com, there was a high speculative value. And at some point in time, there's a need to come down there in specul speculative value because. Uh, because of just what it is speculation, but ultimately there needs to be value seen in the utility aspect of this. And then we have that J curve. And when there's a realization in the utility of that, of that asset, it goes up. Now we we're seeing that with Bitcoin and we've saw that with Bitcoin, there was a lot of speculation and then we had a burst in the bubble, but then all of a sudden we started to see the utility of Bitcoin. A lot of these things, as Chris is mentioning, store value remittances. So all of a sudden there is now the value in the utility of the token that sends it up accordingly the J curve. And I think this is an important and a simple way of looking at these assets uh, for some of these assets like a ripple and, and some of these other cryptos where there's that speculative value, but really does the token, does the coin have any utility? And if it doesn't have any utility, we're probably going to see that go down substantially. But once the utility is realized, and with a lot of these assets, the utilities will be realized, they will shoot up. And and I've, I've done some work taking a look at some of the dot-coms where, and we write about this in the book, where we've seen uh, during the dot-com, the speculative value was such that all of these stocks went up. Well, accordingly, when we realized that there was nobody behind the curtain, they went down to zero. Pets.com, all of these, they went down to zero. But accordingly, if you, even if you look at Amazon's chart, Amazon had that speculative value, and then it came down because people were concerned, and then all of a sudden, we realized that there's a major utility in that asset, and we had the J curve. So those two pieces of it, Chris's work on the valuation and his, and his uh, formulas there, and the crypto J curve, I think a required reading for anyone who really wants to get a basis for the valuation of assets that are out there right now. In the book, we talk about potentially valuing some ICOs, which I think is is another thing to look at as well. But re that's really required reading for anyone looking at uh, the valuation of these assets going forward. So yeah, I mean, like the I think the Chris's post really walks through like the history of Bitcoin and how there was this like speculative value that was accrued in 2013 and then it went out of the market and the utility came up and uh, so the like sort of the ratio of the speculative value and the utility value is what uh, gets changed in a cycle which I feel is what Chris is trying to say is is like a J curve. Uh, my, my question here is when we look at like all of these different assets um, all of them give different kinds of utility, right? So Bitcoin, the utility is supposed to be store of value. Ethereum, the utility is supposed to be accessing transactions in this world computer. Presumably the same for other smart contract platforms. 
monero the utility might be transacting on the dark the, the, the dark net so and some and some of these utility values are entirely subjective right like i might place a very high utility on store of value or somebody else might uh, place very very little value to having a store of value so if if the meaning of utility for all of these different assets is it does not translate from one network to the other and from one person to the other uh, how can a valuation model be based on this idea of utility so it's a great question and um the the idea of utility for any individual crypto network shows up in the pq side of the equation of exchange um, where we have to think about the digital good or service being provisioned um, and what is the price per unit of that digital service and then once i have 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 that um, assumption i can also uh, apply cost decline curves right so just to use a very simple example filecoin um, or we could use something like ORCID, right? Decentralized VPN or a mesh network or whatever it may be. The crypto commodities are easier to do this for. So I'll just run with Filecoin for now. There is a dollar per gigabyte that we know based on current cloud vendors that people are willing to pay to store their, 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 uh, their files. And there is a pretty well-known cost decline curve for storage um, going into the future. And so I can project, you know, what is going to be the dollar per gigabyte stored on the Filecoin network in 2018, 2019, 2020, going out, you know, to 2030. So that's the price. I can also make a projection on the quantity of gigabytes being stored. And I can do that by looking at the total addressable market of cloud storage in gigabytes and creating an S-curve. I use an S-curve um, that actually I used a lot at ARC under the guidance of Brett Winton, the director of research there. Um, where you put in things like, okay, when is when does the network launch? When does um, you know when is there the inflection point at ten percent? How long does the sweet spot of the S curve last? But anyway, an S curve to show the adoption um, cycle within the total addressable market will give me the gigabytes stored by Filecoin in any given year. When I multiply together the price per gigabyte, which is P, by the number of gigabytes, which is Q, I get a dollar amount of value that is transacted in the Filecoin network on any given year in exchange for the good being provided, which is, which is cloud storage. Once I have that, and I can have that for every single year, I then have an assumption around velocity for any given year. And I can divide that PQ by the velocity to get the monetary base necessary to support that economy. And then the last step is, and this is in each subsequent year, right? I have then M, the monetary base, or what we would call the network value. Um, well, network, network value, that gets a little trickier. I can circle back to that. But monetary base in the float to support that economy. And then I divide that by the number of tokens that are in the float to get a utility value price per token every single year. And then let's say I projected that out to 2025. I can take that utility value in 2025 and discount it back to the present to actually get a rational market price um, for this asset today based on future utility value. Some percentage of that rational market price will be supported by current utility value, and the delta is the speculative value. Um, and so that's the basic framework. The only wrinkle in there that I didn't really mention is taking out from the float right at the very beginning the percentage of the asset being held by, by hodlers and stakers if there's you know some bonding net mechanism necessary for the nodes supporting the network because really the only assets available in any given year within that economy are the ones that are freely fro floating and therefore can be exchanged for that good or service you know uh, Brian you mentioned before about the guys with the leather couches and the scotch you should have them they should be watching this type of thinking that's going on because this to me is evidence of what we're looking at here you can't call this a fraud you can't call this something that that is a fad because when you're able to take what chris is talking about and a lot of the things that we've looked at when you're able to take a lot of these uh these resources and these uh these tools to evaluate these assets it further proves 
that we are really looking at assets that need to be considered for investments and for companies going forward. So, you know, I, I would invite all those people as they're sitting around their leather couches and drinking their scotch to pay attention to this, to show them, and like I said before, almost pull the curtain aside that there is a big world out here because what you're going to see, I, I do believe, is the type of thinking that Chris is mentioning is going to be uh, what we're going to see from analysts over the next few years from the investment firms and beyond. And, and we, don't have to, we don't even have to rely on investment firms. Chris's work is all open source. You go to Twitter, you get such amazing analysis that's out there. This clearly shows that we're not in an, a, a situation that is going to go away. This is very solid. This is very, uh, there's a foundation here for these assets. And the fact that you can evaluate them in the manner that Chris is speaking about, I think is something that's very important for people to take, take a look at and, and to understand and recognize. I, I sort of agree that I guess like when the joint stock companies came about for the first time, um, the fundamental ways of valuing these assets as the net present value of the discounted cash flow probably took a century or two in order to be developed, maybe even more, right? And exactly. what, what, what you seem to be suggesting is, okay, um, that there's going to be like rational ways of valuing these crypto assets. And perhaps one of the, your proposal is that MV equals PQ, that equation of uh, monetary velocity uh, is going to be a, is going to be the one that, that does it. So maybe I can take a text, an example and illustrate and like uh, test my thinking of it. So maybe we could like value Ripple using uh, MV equals PQ, like the XRP. So uh, for our listeners that, that may not be aware, uh, the essential role of the XRP is to sort of pay transaction fees every time a transaction occurs on the Ripple network. And the Ripple network ideally um, is going after the market of like cross-border currency transfers. So um, the P here is uh, the price per, per the service. So uh, let's say parties are willing to spend 20 cents in order to transfer money cross border on average. So that becomes P. And then there's a Q, which is the demand for the transfer of cross border money flows in the world. So it'll be a huge number, right? So it'll be per year, there might be, I don't know, trillions of dollars of demand to transfer money like that. So that P, the price, uh, the transaction cost people are willing to pay to transfer money cross border multiplied by the amount of money people are willing to uh, cross borders in a whole year, that is P cross Q. And um, that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is M into V, where V is the velocity, which is how many times are people willing to circulate the in XRP? A given year. If, in a given year, in a, yeah. In a given year. So that depends on sort of the behavior of the holders of Ripple, how they are acting in, in some way. Yes. And if you take this PQ and divide it by V, that should be sort of the market cap of, of Ripple. The monetary base. Yeah. And so um, there are tricky things specifically with the cryptocurrencies. Um, so sometimes I'll consolidate PQ just into annual transaction volume. Um, because that's you know just the turnover of of the of that cryptocurrency. I think the way you approached it is another interesting option. If you said, okay, what is the the average um, dollar per transaction, and what are the number of transactions? Um, specifically, if XRP is only being used to pay fees and not actually the medium that is transacting all of that value, if it's only the fee, I don't know how everything's going to work out for Ripple because you don't have to use XRP necessarily within. Interledger or the Ripple network, I would say the thing that people should most keep in mind around Ripple is um, it has been emphasized as a, a, a fast settlement time cryptocurrency, which implies a high velocity. And the higher the velocity, um, if you think about velocity in the denominator, then the, the, the higher the velocity goes, actually the lower M needs to be to support whatever size economy PQ. And so that's just you know, something that people need to wrap their minds around. And to, to, to go back to the last point of the example I used, 
um, before we perform these calculations, we should take out the percentage of the float that is being held by hobblers or bonders. And so then that only leaves um, the, the assets that are in the float to facilitate this economy, which then allows you to get a monetary base um, that you divide by only the tokens or assets that are in the float to get you a dollar value per token. The trick here is to truly get the network value, you then have to take that dollar value per token and multiply it by all the assets that have ever been issued because not necessarily all of those assets are in the float. And so that's where network value can expand beyond the, the monetary base solely necessary to support that PQ. Cool. Um, well, I want to move to kind of the, the, the other part that perhaps a lot of people uh, are not as familiar with that are listening to this podcast. And, and you guys spend a lot of time on that in the book, which is looking at Bitcoin, looking at crypto assets, uh, more in, in the larger framework of, you know, portfolio, a diversified balanced portfolio. So Jack, you, you are and have done a lot of work around uh, portfolio construction, retirement planning. Can you give, a, I mean, a very just sort of brief uh, overview of like, what are some of the kind of frameworks you use in that and how does cryptocurrency and crypto assets fit into that? This is a very important um, discussion because we're seeing more and more people come into this space and investing money into the space. And, and uh, they're coming in basically throwing money at it and thinking that they're, uh, uh, they're going to make a lot of money. And, and in essence, they have. But when I started to look at this space back in 2013, 2014 as an investment, uh, I looked at it from the perspective of financial planning, asset allocation. And, and in the book... You know, Chris, Chris spent a lot of time with Art Laffer, who's an economist. Uh, we depended on the work of, of uh, Sharp and uh, Harry Markowitz, who was kind to discuss um, uh, modern portfolio theory. So it's very important to evaluate investing in anything from the perspective of your overall portfolio. Now, everyone's going to have a different risk profile. Everyone's going to have different financial goals or whatnot. But to put all your assets into all your money into one asset, you may look back and may say, well, I made a lot of money on Bitcoin. Thank God I didn't put in anything else. But you've always got to protect yourself against the risk. So when I looked at this, I looked at this from the uh, portfolio allocation and asset allocation models that are out there, which typically you'll see are equities, and bonds. Back in 2008, after the financial crisis, a lot of the financial firms uh, realized that you didn't get that diversification by being in stocks and bonds. When the markets crashed, they both went down. So there was this view that you needed to have assets that were non-correlated. Uh, and this asset class uh, known as, or asset classification known as alternative assets, became something that the financial firms started to say, you need to have a portion of non-correlated assets in your portfolio to protect yourself uh, against downturns in the market. So we started to see allocations come along that said maybe 50% in equities, 30% in bonds, and 20% in these alternative assets as a way to protect your uh, portfolio. And a lot of this depends upon the work that, like I said, Harry Markowitz did in modern portfolio theory. So when you take a look at alternative assets, what you find is they typically are made up of things like gold or real estate, uh, or hedge funds and things of that nature that are non-correlated to the rest of the market. So my view was, well, it seems to me that something like Bitcoin fits that model of an alternative asset. And when we started to take a look at the non-correlation of the asset and, and recognizing that it's actually there's actually a higher level of non-correlation between Bitcoin and the overall markets, equities and bonds, than even gold, it's, it, it provides even uh, a better level of non-correlation than these other assets. And we've done some other work around volatility and things of that nature. Ultimately, the feeling was Bitcoin can fit into your portfolio, a prudently allocated portfolio, as an alternative asset. And in this way, financial professionals, investment professionals, can potentially look at this asset for their clients and provide diversification, provide portfolio protection by investing into Bitcoin and crypto assets as this alternative asset uh, sleeve. 
And that was what I made my investment uh, in Bitcoin on back in 2013, 2014. And it's a big part of what we tell people now in the book is how they should be looking at their overall portfolio and investing accordingly into these assets. Now, of course, everyone's situation is different. Someone like Chris, who's a lot younger than me, he may be willing to take a little bit more allocation into crypto assets than potentially I am, who, who is closer to distribution of, of assets than accumulation of assets. So everyone is different. But to be able to view your portfolio in a more holistic manner and say, where do crypto assets fit in? You know, we feel that there is principles and there are resources and tools to do that. And uh, so that's, that's really where I feel that if you view these crypto assets in, as an alternative investment and fit them in accordingly to your portfolio, then you can find that then you can fit them in in a prudent manner. Now, at, as that happens, let's say you invest 10 percent into crypto assets and you had done that for the last year, you might realize that that 10 percent is now 30 percent of your portfolio because of how 90%. it's grown. So then you have to take a look at rebalancing that portfolio and bringing it back to your asset allocation. Now, that's that becomes something that's of interest to people because they're saying, wait a minute, I've got this winner here. Why don't I just ride that horse and keep going? So you've got to take a look at your own situation and say, do I need to do some rebalancing to come back to my original portfolio allocation? And someone like Harry Markowitz in Modern Portfolio Theory would say rebalancing is important. Does that mean that you sell all your winners and and because maybe you have nothing but winners in your portfolio? Well, then it becomes something to to consider. And I know Brian, you and I have talked a little bit about. Uh, I think it was Wences who who wrote this article about uh, not selling Bitcoin or keeping a portion of your Bitcoin because it's potentially could go up. I think it's an interesting perspective, but I also think you have to have rules in place when you invest. And those rules can be around asset allocation and portfolio allocation and things along those lines. Additionally, there may be some rules within the crypto asset space. I have kind of learned myself that as much as I would love to rebalance and sell things and come back to a prudent uh, asset allocation model, I may find that maybe from my perspective, I don't want to sell all of it. So I've found myself selling potentially 70% and keeping 30% for the long run. So this is, in essence, actually pushing some of the rules that are out there around asset allocation. But I think it's very important for people when they start to invest in this. And the key thing is invest in this and put this into their portfolio. They have to do it with the rules. And that's why it's very important. Like I said, we spend a lot of time in the book around how this fits as an alternative investment within prudent asset allocation. And, and I do want to add um, one thing. I, I think everything Jack just said is, is great and on point and um, prudent when, when getting off the ground in this space, right? Like first rule always of crypto investing is never invest more money than you're willing to lose. Just time and time and time again. That said, depending on who you are and depending how early you got into the crypto space, um, you may be at a point now where you have set aside a nest egg in, in, in hopefully an asset outside of the crypto space that's totally uncorrelated to crypto. And maybe you have a diversified portfolio there of equities, bonds, real estate, precious metals. It all depends on how much you've made in the crypto space. But from there, if you have that, then you know this idea of hodling and compounding capital starts to get extremely important um, because if you just bought and held Bitcoin or Ether or whatever it, it, it is and you let that compound, 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 let's say you've taken out your cost, so at that point it's just monopoly money for you, that is when the returns can be truly astounding. Um, and so, I mean, it's the idea that, it, that, that you need money to make money. Um, and so it really, it's a nuanced subject because it really depends on what your risk profile and your asset base is um, as an investor. The other thing I would add, and Chris, I think you're, it's a very exciting time for people who have invested in the space and are investing in the space. The thing I will also throw in there as well is don't lose sight of the fact that at least here in the United States, the tax man is watching. And we're starting to see even with the new tax law, 
that there are going to be some more stringent uh, taxing uh, regulations that are going to come into play here. So just recognize this. Recognize you've got to do your record keeping and recognize that there may be some reasons for tax selling and things along those lines. But I, I think the beauty of this whole discussion is we've, we've moved from just Bitcoin, the technology, the societal impact that it has, to now evaluating it and the crypto assets in the investment space and putting all of these uh, all of these concepts of financial planning, asset allocation, that Brian's buddies with the scotch and the leather couches spend a lot of time doing, and now we've gone there and we've in integrated that into the discussion. It's a very exciting time, uh, and it's and and hopefully, like like you know, I've I've often said it's Bitcoin is almost a gateway drug for millennials to invest and for people to get involved in investing. So I think it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, and I'm glad it's legal. Well, let's speak a little bit about where we are right now. So right, you guys wrote this book. Uh, I mean, it came out pretty recently. Uh, it came out a few months ago. But, um, of course, publishing being slow, you had to finish it earlier, and I think you had some kind of date. Maybe it was January, I think, of last year, exactly a year ago. End of March, uh, start of April is when we submitted the full rough draft of the manuscript to McGraw right. Hill. But, but you, I think you had the cutoff date where you used basically when you, when you talked about the values and returns, right? I think that was in January. So we did a few things. It depends on the chapter. Um, you're, you're absolutely right that for some of the Bitcoin specific chapters, we just said, okay, st Jan 1, 2017, so that we wouldn't cherry pick. We wouldn't be accused of cherry picking. But then for, for, many, for some of the other assets, depending on what we were exploring and the point we were trying to emphasize, we just included as much data as we could, say, for like volatility analysis or, or developer contributions. And so some of those data points took us up to the start of April 2017. But, you know, um, when we started writing the book, Ether was at $7, Bitcoin was at 700 And uh, it was like uh, <laughs> writing while running up a mountain or running up an avalanche. Right. And you know, what's interesting, another point about it is that we had the cutoff in, in March. And I remember Chris and I, we were, we had written obviously about the ETFs and there was a whole Winklevoss ETF. And if you remember, the decision was coming down about the Winklevoss ETFs in March. March 10th. March, March 10th. 10th. And so we were, we were very nervous because as much as you can say about the numbers, we made the content um, around theory to make it as evergreen as possible so that the numbers don't detract from the message. But here we were with the Winklevoss situation, which could be out of date two weeks after we it went to the publisher. So, so we had to hold off on that. And I think that was the last thing that we ended up fixing was finally when the decision came down around the Winklevoss ETFs, fitting that into the yeah. book. And, and that, was, that was a bit nerve-wracking for us. So I, I do want to kind of come back to this though, right? Because I agree. I mean, I think if you look at the content, the like valuation methods, uh, analysis, the portfolio things, like all of those, they, I think they're still valid, right? They still kind of make sense. However, um, the, the figure of the kind of, aggregate cryptocurrency crypto asset market cap at that time was around 24 billion i think when you wrote it today we're at over 700 so we have an increase of about 30x now obviously people bought back then you know they would have followed your advice although i guess it was hard to do since the book wasn't out yet uh they would have done phenomenally well but what about today i mean do you guys feel the same way i mean because also if you if you if you look at it the thing today, a few days ago, I looked at this Tron, right? Tron 15 billion. So it was like, what is Tron? To read the white paper, and it's like some incre. I mean, I don't know, maybe there's something there, but like it's just so it seems very incoherent, poorly written thing that unclear if it's anything at all. And then we have things like uh, Kodak now announcing Kodak coin. We, we obviously seem to be in some kind of crazy bubble so how, how do you think about it today here's an interesting so i'm definitely going to answer that but i just blew my mind for a second so i'll share it with you guys the official release date of the book was october 19th 2017 without anyone looking what was the aggregate uh network value of all crypto assets uh october 19 2017 no looking 
I want to hear everyone guess. 150. Oh, very close, Brian. 170 billion. So it has gone up 4x since the book was published. I'm not taking credit credit for that bull <laughs> run by any means. Um, maybe maybe Mr. Tater had had a little bit to do with it. But you know, all all jesting aside, um, the markets are white hot right now. There's there's no doubt about that. It is not a situation where I would recommend someone dumping in, you know, all of their life savings. I, I don't think I would ever recommend that. But even, you know, sort of this prudent model that that Jack and I talk about of one to five percent, depending on your your risk profile, etc. Even with that money, I would I would recommend averaging in and realizing more than anything this is a multi-decadal gain. And if we approach what's going on with crypto assets from um, Carlotta Perez's framework of technological revolutions and financial capital, then this is, we are less than 10 years into a 50-year techno-economic paradigm shift. And um, it fits all of the patterns in terms of the web is consolidating around Google, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. They are data aggregators that are crushing the competition. Meanwhile, you have an open data layer system called blockchains, which are percolating up, growing fast, um, and inevitably, um, with these highly disruptive innovations and these techno-economic paradigm shifts, you're going to have all kinds of volatility, right? Speculation lays the foundation for innovation, and we are really entering um, what Carlo, Carlotta would call the frenzy stage. So we've been in the eruption stage, we are now entering the frenzy stage, where increasingly financial capital will divorce itself from, from the actual reality, from what's being built. And we're going to see some cycles over this, um, of this over the next few years, I would argue. And then the question becomes, okay, when does the music stop and when do we have the big crash? Because lots of people have been talking about, oh, this is a bubble and we're going to have a crash and blah, blah, blah. And I agree with all of that. But I think in 2017, we had three, if not four, corrections of 30 or 40 percent, right? In the traditional capital markets, that's a crash. Um, in crypto, I classify a crash more as 80 percent plus. Um, when we look at late 2013 to January 2015, Bitcoin lost 85 percent of its value. And so when I think about that big crash, we may have one of those, say, in 2018. I don't know. I, I don't have a crystal ball. But when I think of the big crash in the longitudinal perspective, um, I'm looking at the peak of the tech and telecom boom, 2000 Bloomberg Tech Index was, um, when you adjust it for inflation, about $4 trillion. Um, so we right now are about 20% of the way there. And the tech and te telecom boom, that shed, we shed a couple trillion in value. And so I think that the big crash will come when we are you know, well into the trillions. Um, I think we will lose, we will shed trillions of dollars in, in network value. Um, but until then, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not obsessing over trying to call this crash. I think Peter Lynch is famous for saying far, far more money has been lost preparing for corrections than in corrections. This is, if you think about the tailwinds of what's going on here and you are approaching it from a 50-year techno-economic paradigm perspective, and you are just adding, adding, incrementally, responsibly, adding, 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 um, over time, you will be fine in 2015, or, sorry, in 2015, 250. You will get hurt if you're buying a ton now, freaking out in six months because half of your net worth is, is gone, and so on and so forth. So it's really important, um, and I'll end my tirade now, to just responsibly ease into things. There's no rush. We're going to go through booms and busts. Um, the big one is probably a few years out when we're well into the trillions or five years out or 10 years out. Um, but it's just important to remain cool headed about what's going on here. I want to make one comment. I, I, I totally agree with Chris. You mentioned before about Tron and Tronics. And I, I want to draw, I want to draw something to the book that I think you know, Chris and I spent a lot of time on this, recognizing that things were going, things could potentially blow up a, as they have. But we also put things in the book uh, on how to value assets that I think stand the test of time and can be evaluated, and people need to look at. You mentioned Tronics, okay, and we all know we've seen that rise up. You mentioned about the white paper. 
in the book, we lay down a framework for how to evaluate assets. And, and specifically, these are things that can be used for the ICOs out there, white paper, uh, developers, community, all those types of things. And the reason we did that was so that people would view assets that they were going to put their money into, like a Tron, and put it through this evaluation method that we put out there. You mentioned about the white paper of Tron, and we're now seeing articles about Tron and what was wrong with it. If you had gone and taken a look at our framework for evaluating these things and evaluating ICOs that we talked about in the book, you might have recognized these types of things. In fact, we even talk about Ponzi schemes, the history of Ponzi schemes and what Ponzi schemes mean for twofold. First, to kind of sh talk about how Bitcoin wasn't a Ponzi scheme, but additionally, to also say how you could potentially see crypto assets that are Ponzi schemes. So we, we, we laid out a lot of these, these uh, theories and a lot of this framework out there, not only that, that doesn't really have any, it's not set in time, but can be used to evaluate the crypto assets out there. When we talk about this time is different thinking, I mean, this is the type of thinking that people have around crypto assets. They need to understand the historical basis of this as well. And, and that's why you'll see chapters in there that talk about a lot of these things. And the reason is, is not, so much, not so much to get hung up on, on the numbers that are in the book, but the theory and the foundation for studying this space that we tried to lay out in the book that we feel can transcend any time and any market movements. Great. You know, I, I actually, I totally agree that the book does deliver on that and um, it does provide some very good um, frameworks and methods for, for going about this. Now, there's w one more thing I would love to get kind of your assessment on. So we did a podcast with Ari Paul that I'm sure you guys know. Uh, I think it was maybe around five, six months ago. I think that was, I'm not sure if he had started, if they had started to fund it, they were just about to start. And, you know, as, as Chris, as you pointed out, the market cap even then was much lower. And he at that point said that, okay, he knew of about, or he estimated that there was about a hundred billion of kind of, you know, institutional, you know, kind of traditional investment money waiting to be invested into the space. And I mean, that is the one thing that I feel like, even though these valuations seem outlandish in many cases, that there's just this avalanche of people basically following exactly your advice, Jack, and saying, okay, I should have some exposure to this thing. It is a good asset class to have in the portfolio. It has a big future. You know, I must get into this. Uh, and, and not so much exactly looking at the project, right? So how, how do you guys look at this situation right now? Do you also see this huge avalanche of just money coming in? And, and maybe one, one point to add, to me, it seems that it has a kind of inevitability to it as well, right? Because if you know others are going to do it and others are going to say, I want 3% of my portfolio in crypto, you know that has to survive the prices up. So you also want to do it, right? And you rather do it before the others. Um, do, you, do you guys think this is a big driver and will continue to be a big driver? So something that I'm always looking at, there's kind of two parts to your question. There's, I would say, the institutional capital and then the retail capital and what's coming in and what's coming in when. I think we're still at the tip of the iceberg with institutionals. I mean, you've got some, some clearly you've, you, you had the hedge fund um, lift and craze of 2017, the crypto hedge fund. But in terms of sort of a established financial incumbents, a lot of them, they, they do have their toes in the water. You know, um, um, a lot of like the authorized participants or trading shops or people are working on this, traditional hedge funds, um, they are working on this. So they're there, but they're not deploying capital at scale yet because weirdly enough, especially for some of the big quant hedge fund shops, the markets are still too small, still too small um, in terms of liquidity and, 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 and the volume that they would like to move through um, uh, with, with their algos. So... I don't think the institutional side is there in the way um, that it's sometimes portrayed. And a great example um, of that would be what happened to Kodak stock yesterday, right? Kodak announces Kodak coin, um, which is really issuance of a new asset that there's no indication of how that asset is going to drive cash flows to increase the value of Kodak stock, which is how Kodak stock is valued. And nonetheless, the stock, I think, popped 130%, $150 million in value was created, 
And I would argue that is more because in the traditional capital markets where more institutional investors are, there is still a thirst for products that they can trust, that they can hold to gain some kind of exposure to crypto without holding crypto directly. And so um, that was an example to me of the unmet um, um, demand and thirst on the institutional side still for crypto exposure. And it's just going to require more uh, securitized instruments, instruments that fit the puzzle pieces of ETFs or mutual funds or uh, other institutional money managers' um, constraints, right? They, they can't buy Bitcoin directly. It's not necessarily that they don't want to. Um, then on the retail side, I'm always trying to figure out what amount of this appreciation is due to new fiat currency coming into the markets versus sort of the speculation multiple where people bid the price of assets back up and uh, 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 up back and forth. So I bid up Ripple and then I can bid up Ether and then I can bid up Bitcoin. And we see this cycle, right, where Bitcoin pumps and then some air comes out of it, the alt or, or all the other crypto assets pump. Now Ethereum is starting to develop its own thing. But there's this rotation cycle within crypto assets. And so I estimate roughly 15 billion a month comes into the crypto markets of new fiat. Um, and I can run through that calculation. It's basically just, you know, assumptions around the number of new users per day, the average buy-in per new user, and 30 days in a month. Um, and so, I mean, that's a very back-of-the-envelope estimate, but that's how I approach the retail uh, inflow and interest as well. Let me just let me just uh, respond to, to Chris's Chris's point, which I think is is a very, very valid point about Kodak, is that it does show the appetite for the retail investor to want to get involved in this space. And I mentioned before the Winklevoss ETF uh, and how that was dismissed and how we still don't have one. I think you're going to see that change over the next year or so. I think you're going to start to see um, Bitcoin-based ETFs come along and uh, and may potentially other kinds of cryptos. The, the key thing here is that the user experience for the retail side has to be improved. I mean, you can talk to people who say, you know, I want to get involved. I open up an account on Coinbase. Everybody gets pointed to Coinbase and, and they grow frustrated. And then they want to buy this asset and they have to go to another exchange. It is not an easy thing to do. It is a hard job, honestly, to invest in crypto assets. The user experience has to be improved and there have to be instruments that I think will make it easy for people to invest. We're getting there. I think it's an opportunity and I think you're going to see it. Additionally, I think you're going to see diversification in the space. I think you potentially will see investments that allow you to invest in different segments and have diversification. Ethereum, perhaps Monero, perhaps a Ripple in a portfolio. I think you're going to see these types of things. One point on the institutional uh, point that, that Chris made, I thought it was very interesting this year with ICOs. Beginning of the year, ICOs Anybody could get into ICOs. It was a very democratic way for the average person to really make some money. I remember the old days of IPOs. Uh, you couldn't get an IPO unless you went and played golf and let your broker win at golf. That was the only way you could get an IPO stock. Okay, now all of a sudden we have the ICO market and anyone can get in. And, and six months ago, you could have threw a dart at any of these ICOs and you could have made money. What we've seen now is obviously we've seen a lot of lousy ICOs come along, but we've also seen institutional shops start to jump in and say, wait a minute, we want that ICO. So you've seen some of the uh, the democratic nature uh, and the individuals benefiting from ICOs kind of falling by the wayside with a number of these ICOs, which has shown the institutional money coming in. And I mean, how many times have you looked at the ICO market since then? There's a pre, 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 pre-sale and millions are being thrown in by by institutional shops and institutional money. So I think that's been an interesting aspect as well. But clearly it shows institutional money is coming in. I think to Chris's point, very valid. Uh, the markets may not be big enough for that. Uh, but on the retail side, there is a huge opportunity for people to come along with, with investment vehicles that are user-friendly and allow people to easily and seamlessly get involved in this space and not have to wait for a company to change their name uh, to incorporate blockchain or to come up with coins or whatever, uh, to, but to be able to play in this market and do it easily. And then I think once that happens, the exciting thing for me is then people can rely upon advisors and investment professionals to provide 
uh, advice to them around this space because right now they're running blind and we need to see some more advice and professional help around this space to help out the, the uh, average investor. Makes sense. So uh, we're coming to the end of the show. So I think the final thing we'd like to cover is your experience of writing the book and uh, and and like so your book is one of the first that really tries to go into the theory of like like classify crypto assets value crypto assets and covers the whole universe as opposed to being a book just about bitcoin after you published the book the markets have changed a lot is there anything in particular that you wish you had done differently well to give a little bit of background um, and then circle back to what do we wish we had done differently, um, you know, the book was born by Jack sitting down next to me at Consensus 2016, I think it was. And Jack was the one who pitched me on the idea of the book. Jack's really the one. Jack was the genesis of the idea of the book. And he was like, you know, I'll get us, uh, I know an editor, I'll get us an agent, we'll submit a book proposal. And I was kind of in disbelief. Um, and we, we went and we did it. And um, lo and behold, we got a deal from McGraw-Hill, I think, in November of 2016, started writing December of 2016. So it all came together rather quickly. But when we were putting together the book proposal, what we, what we realized is there truly was a market opportunity. Because um, while the crypto asset markets weren't you know, the craze that they are today, I think when we started writing the book, actually, they were at $10 billion in network value for the actual start in November December of 2016. Um, but what we realized is there had, there had been two previous eras of books about this space. There had been the Bitcoin books, right? Like uh, uh, Jack's early book, um, but then um, the, the Bitcoin Big Bang, the age of cryptocurrencies. And I would say Digital Gold by Nathaniel Popper really sort of um, was the marquee book of the Bitcoin era of books. The second era really followed sort of the progression of the space. They were the blockchain books, right? Or the blockchain borderline not Bitcoin books. Um, you know, that sort of Bitcoin winter we went through of 2014, 2015, 2016, as people were, you know, saying, oh, clearly Bitcoin's not going to work. It's dying. But it's this blockchain thing, this DLT thing that's really cool. And so we had those books. Um, and, 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 you know, the authors of those books, they are fans of crypto. So, so I should give them credit for that. Um, but the emphasis is on blockchain technology and um, with the blockchain revolution really encapsulating that era. This third era that we felt coming, but we, we, we saw a window for and an opportunity to write a book for is really the crypto asset era. It's going beyond Bitcoin. It's going beyond blockchain technology. It's saying this is an asset class as a whole. This is the whole variety of what's going on here. This is what it means as, a, as an innovation for the world, but really focusing on the permissionless public blockchains because you never ever bet against open in the history of information technology. And so that's why we wrote this book and we, felt, we, we feel very fortunate with our timing. And um, we do think that there will be a proliferation and we're already seeing it on Amazon with self-published books of these more broader crypto focused books, um, sort of this third era of, of, of books on this space. In terms of things that we wish we had done differently, I mean, Jack and I joke about this often and we, we, we have been getting inquiries about, you know, will we update the book or will we write um, a sequel or what do we want to do? Um, I have to focus on placeholder. I'm exhausted. I don't think I can write another book for a while. Um, but it is true. I'll, I'll just leave it to blogging on Medium for now. But it is true that... Um, there is so much I think Jack and I have learned over the last year that we could write a second book, no problem, and not, not to say it would be better than the first book, it would just go into more detail on more topics that we know people are craving. And so um, I'm happy with how we did the book. I think we could write another amazing book if, if we put our minds to it or each individually do that. Um, and. I guess uh, where, I f where, where I finally land on the book is it fits a market need and provides the foundation that a lot of people are craving in this space right now from a perspective that they can relate to. I, I, will, just share, I will just share with you a, a little bit of a secret here is that originally uh, we wanted to call the book or 
the book was going to be called something different. And it was interesting because we spent a lot of time uh, discussing this. But originally, the book was going to be called Blockchain Assets. And, uh, and we spent a lot of time evaluating that. And, and a lot of that discussion... Which would have been a nightmare. Right, right. And a lot of that, <laughs> and even crypto assets, people are like, what, what the heck? I, you know, they're expecting a horror story. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of our discussions around that crystallized a lot of our thinking around the taxonomy and led us to the spaces that we, we brought the book. So we grew a lot writing the book and our... And it really crystallized and, and synergized our thinking around this. I, I, I do want to share one last thing uh, uh, about it, uh, which I think is uh, is a good example of this whole space. Uh, we published the book, and we have a very good publisher. And the book came out, and the book met some immediate su success. That success was really a surprise to the publisher, to the point that if we have listeners out there who were who went on to Amazon and found themselves being unable to buy the book because it was out of stock, it wasn't our fault. Uh, I think that people were surprised by the interest and the support uh, in this book and in this title, and I think it surprised even the publisher, uh, which I think says a lot about this whole space, is that there's still this, this disbelief or this dismissal of this space uh, as being as big and as of interest as it is. Uh, and, and I think that was kind of an example of this. And, you know, where we go with this uh, going forward, we don't know. We were trying to, you know, like Chris says, trying to keep our uh, social media and medium and, and even the website that we have uh, about the book up to, up to speed. Um, but uh, it was an interesting take. I'm glad I was able to do it with Chris. And, uh, and I do believe that the book... Um, has found a good time uh, in in um, in being published where it was, but I do think there's a lot of value that if you go into the book can transcend this current time frame and even things into the future. And we tried to put a lot of theory in there, which I think still uh, still pays dividends to this day. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, guys, for coming on. It was a real pleasure. We were running quite late, but it was so enjoyable. I can't, uh, you know, uh, that's how it goes. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for writing uh, this book and coming on. It, it was really interesting to talk with you guys. I'm sure there will be a lot of kind of follow-ons and updates and changes in, in the valuation frameworks, the markets, and hopefully we can uh, do a repeat of this at some point. Um, of course, we will uh, link to the book, um, some of Chris's medium posts on this valuation framework, Jack's articles about how lost, he lost his retirement money in Bitcoin and, uh, and then gained it again. And yeah, so I hope we just can check this out. And yeah, thanks so much for tuning in once again. We are going to be back next week. And if you want to support the show, you can uh, leave us an iTunes review. Actually, Chris, you did that once. I saw it. So thanks for that. I did. I did. I'm still waiting for my T-shirt. Yeah, actually. yeah. Well, we're gonna get new T-shirts made, and you're gonna get the first one. Wait, what do I have to do? What do I have to do for a shirt? Come on, I'm one of those guys that loves <laughs> free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can you leave us an iTunes review, or you can send a really nice note, and, and probably either either one will work. Well, thanks, you guys. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.